my message today is a nation's hope. And that name of hope is Jesus. And we're looking at Psalm 33, if you want to turn your Bibles to follow along. A lot of people, <clears throat> they, look, they look for hope and like the prophet said, some trust in chariots and horses, but I will remember the name of the Lord. And uh, some people put their hope and their eyes fixed on political parties, political figures. Sports people look to sports figures. They look to all kinds of places. They look to money. They look to fame. Uh, they look to uh, relationships that are human. They look to their family and they put family before God. And the hope is not in all of that. All of that becomes healthy and beautiful as gifts from God if we put God first. We keep our eyes, as a Hebrew writer said, fixed on Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was laid before him, he endured the cross. He went through hard times. And let me tell you something. I'm not dismayed. I'm not afraid. God is our God. The word I gave you a few months ago, and I've given it several times, get right with God, stay right with God, and don't be afraid. Don't back up, don't pause, move forward. The world needs the church. We're the light. Jesus is the light, he's in us. We are the salt. If we are full of God, of his word, of his holiness, that salt will be powerful. But so many times the church has failed our culture because we're powerless. We have definition salvation. We don't have born again by the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, raising us from our dead, taking away our desire to sin, changing how we think, changing how we feel, changing how we see things so that we view things through a biblical worldview. That we believe this book. And that's the hope that we have, Jesus Christ, the living word, the word that became the incarnate word that came alive and lives in us. And we have that. But if, we, if we're not uh, living in power, the power of the spirit that he sent to be witnesses, then this earth is in trouble. Because no matter who is running the political parties, no matter who is, is, uh, is uh, how big the military might is, it doesn't matter. We are hopeless because we live in a society that is depraved, a hedonistic culture where right is wrong and wrong is right, where no longer the common sense morals of the Bible are followed, where people openly live together and don't care or aren't bothered about actually being married like the Bible says, where people are uh, throwing all caution morally to the wind that go, if, it, if I'm not hurting anybody else, it's okay. If it feels good, it's okay. People that have turned marriage into something other than what the Bible says it is. People that think that life doesn't begin at conception. People that have their own ideas. And here's what I say, guys. If you don't believe the book, don't be trusting Jesus. Because all of this stuff in here, how can you say, I'm going to take this out, this out, that out, and not believe something? How do you do that? And then pick, cherry pick the Jesus that forgives your sins while you live your lollygag American comfort life of pride and self and greed. How? How is that possible? Our hope that we have personally is Jesus. And I believe there's going to be a great awakening in our nation. I believe that many people are come to Jesus. I believe when trouble comes, people look up. They know. People at the end of life are turning. They're looking for hope. They're crying out for God's help. And I will tell you right now that in this world, people are very fearful. People without God don't have the peace of God. They're very fearful. I don't think that there's any fear. I have no fear. I know where I'm going to go. I'm persuaded he's able to keep me until that day. And my hope is in Jesus, in the blood of Christ, the solid rock, Jesus Christ. My hope is in him. And I know the blessed hope is that we will go to be with him someday because Christ has made that a sure thing. It's not I hope so hope. It's a blessed hope. It's a sure hope. It's a confident hope because the book says my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And there's a place that he's prepared for me in heaven. And he's made it for you too. And those of you watching online and those of you in the mass service, he's made it for all of us. We to call on the name of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, the gospel's been watered down to a definition gospel. There's no more any power thereof. That's why people live like they do, with ungrateful hearts and selfish and greedy and thoughtless. 
hateful, unforgiving, mean-spirited because Jesus Christ hasn't changed their heart. What is Jesus like and what are you like? We need more of Jesus and less of us. And we need to fall on our knees and say, Christ, you're the one that can save me. I am hopelessly lost depraved, selfish. I can't change my heart. I can't make myself desire the word. I can't make myself want to come to church. I can't make myself want to worship God. I can't make myself want to give to your kingdom. I can't make myself change. Only God can change my heart. When I look at the world, I feel, I believe I feel what God feels and I see what God sees because I have a biblical view because I'm, I get full of the word, I get full of the spirit, I get full of the spirit that makes the word alive and I get full of Jesus. And I feel about the world the way he does with truth and compassion. You see, there's no love without truth. There's no truth without love. They're balanced. You can't separate them because Jesus is truth and Jesus and God is love. The fruit of his spirit, the Holy Spirit. The spirit of truth is also the fruit of love. So if you have the spirit, you have love and truth. And many people just want God with love. They don't want the truth. Well, you're going to get the truth. Because I'll never quit preaching the truth. And if it offends you, Jesus said something about that sword, the word that's double-edged. is not meant to make you go away feeling all oh, comfy, comfy. And I've had both Baptists and Assembly of God pastors tell me they never want anybody to leave their church feeling bad. Well, I want, to, want you to know something. If there's something not right, I'm going to cut you straight in the heart with it. Because this word, it's a dagger. It'll open you up. It'll do surgery on you so you change your life. Because truth, love tells the truth. And if someone that knows there's an eternity without God, and the consequences of not awakening and calling on Jesus will tell you the truth because they love you. Are you with me? I care about you and I know you're a good church. But I believe we need to examine ourselves. And at the close of the service, I'm going to ask you to examine, is there anything not right with you between you and God? Anything. In Psalm 33, verse 12 is a key verse. It says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And in Proverbs 14, 34, it says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. And then it goes on in 35 to say, when a person lives for God, God's favor rests on them. He puts his blessing and removes his blessing according to your response to him. I want to be under the blessing of God, don't you? There is a blessing. And the reason that God doesn't bless you and pretend everything is okay, because if he does, you'll go on your lollygagging way, going on in your sin, and you'll never repent. And your life may be comfortable here, but any lovingly father will discipline his children and make things not so good for you to get you to wake up. And guess what? Sometimes it takes hitting the ground hard. And sometimes it takes a person coming to the end of their rope before they'll look up. And if America needs uh, difficulty to have them look up, then so be it. Amen? Now listen, you think about Cuba. You think about Iran. You think about uh, China. You think about India. Missionaries tell you that where the martyrs shed their blood in the ground, the soil, that there's a fertilizer there that brings great salvation. And when persecution comes to the church, it flourishes. The Cuban church is exploded. In fact, you can't even join the church unless you win one lost person to Jesus. You can't attend their house churches. It's exploded. They are fervent. They're ready to die. They have very little. They're not sitting there living for the things that money can buy. They're not living for the next entertainment moment. They're not living for the pleasures of the flesh. They're living for Jesus. You see, if some of these things that are temporary, if we would li we'd understand if we wouldn't be so caught up with worried about what's going to happen to our 401ks or whatever else, and we were more worried about souls that are going to go to hell without us giving them the truth of the gospel, then we would see that trouble is okay. And there are people that feel hopeless, when Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, he's still King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen? Amen? He's in our hearts, and we have eternal life. And we shall not die, but live. Amen? So, <clears throat> it doesn't matter. You know, God's in charge. He's sovereign. I believe that with all of my heart. And uh, 
I'm, 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 I'm believing that if a nation's going to have a hope, they got to follow what the psalmist said here. It doesn't tell us exactly who wrote this, most think David. But Psalm 33, 1 to 5, the first point I have for you is that America needs to turn back to a, 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 a land that was give honor and praise to God. Returning of the praise unto the Lord God. I will extol you. No, that's th verse chapter 30. Here's 33. Sing for joy in the Lord, O ye righteous ones. You see, some people joy in, in, in their money. They joy in their talent. They joy in their entertainment. They find their joy everywhere but in Jesus. See, joy in Jesus is meant for times when it's troublesome. Jesus said, in this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And so today, if you don't have joy, which is the inside job where God's the joy of the Lord, where you're walking in him and in his presence, and you're letting the happenstances of life keep you from being happy. I mean, you may not be jump, jumping up and down about things, but the joy of the Lord is our strength. And if the joy fills your heart, it's going to make a difference in who you are. People want something that follows something that people have that's deeper than everyone else has. And everyone else panics. Everyone else is afraid. Everyone else uh, doesn't have any confidence in God when trouble comes to the land. But God is the same. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We have a reason to hope. We don't have to panic. We don't have to be afraid of anything. God is on our side. As believers in Jesus Christ, as those that are called in the name of Jesus Christ, he's our father, he's with us, he's in us, and he goes before us. And we need to get back to extolling the Lord, to singing for joy to the Lord, to praising him, if we're, if we're the righteous ones. And praise is becoming to the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyres. Sing praises to him with a harp and ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. A shout of joy. Woo! Say, hallelujah, right? Shout. I mean, I mean, come on. The Cyclone fans barely got out of there with a win against those Baylor Bears. And I heard them shouting for joy, but it wasn't for the Lord. And that's a victory, but the greatest victory is in Jesus Christ. And for those of you visiting and watching online, I'm a Baylor Bear. I'm okay with it. I never want my Bears to mess up the Cyclones if they're having a winning season and can win the Big 12. And we pretty much aren't doing too good anyway, so I was okay. I'm just glad we didn't get, I'm just glad we didn't get beat, beat by 40, you know. I really appreciate that quarterback giving us some points, just throwing it right to us. Those Cyclone fans, hats off. But say our praises to God. His love, verse 5, his love, he loves righteousness and justice. I love righteousness and justice. I get, I have a problem with my flesh rising up when there's not that going on. I see a bully bullying someone on a playground, even though it might be a six-year-old, I won't take him behind the woodshed and give him a little business, you know. I wouldn't do it, but think about it. I think, where's the parent? Where? Can't do that anymore. Yeah, there's better ways to handle it. And we, you know, I know that the best way to do it is get in their face and live it out. The earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. That's God. That's our God. Let me tell you something. He's worthy to be praised. There's joy in Jesus. He's loving. He's kind. He's gracious. He's merciful. He's forgiving. He's with us. He's Emmanuel. He doesn't leave us. His promises are sure and amen. We have a heaven. And listen, America, to have hope again, needs to realize God is God and start praising him as God. And quit praising the pastors, the TV evangelists, and the sports figures, and everyone else. You know? And you, you realize that's what we do. We look to, we're always looking for a man. You know, that's why Israel, God didn't want Israel to have a king. He wanted to have a, a priest, a prophet. But we always look for man. And no matter what, no matter what arena it is, look for a man. And we, and we exalt men. You see it all the time. And therefore, when the right man is not for us or with us or able to help us, we feel hopeless. But guess what? There is a man who never sinned, born of a virgin. His name is Jesus, and he's all-powerful. In his name, demons will have to flee. And in his name, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The name of Jesus is the hope of the world, and it's our hope. Don't be dismayed. Don't be afraid. God is with us. His name is Jesus Emmanuel. Amen? We need to get back to praising God as God. The second thing we need 
is to recognize God as our creator. Psalm 33, starting in verse six. You know, the schools, I don't know, well, I don't understand how we got so far away from acknowledging there's a creator. To believe in evolution to me, it's like believing that I can throw some parts that look like a watch together and shake it or leave it there for millions of years and it becomes a watch. It's, it takes more faith to believe in evolution. You know, there is a creator. He's created you. I mean, anyone that's honest would take a look at a newborn baby and goes, there's a creator. You look at the universe and science, there's a creator. And it says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. God spoke, right? And by the breath, that word breath is a spirit because it was a, he breathed life into Adam. He breathed life into Eve. The, he breathed the life of Jesus upon the Virgin Mary. That breath of God, and by his breath, the spirit of his mouth, all their hosts, stars, the sky, everything. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. I'm gonna tell you something. If you don't believe that God made everything, then how do you believe any of this? See, I'm, I'm gonna tell you right now, that's the beginning, that's the first, that's the Genesis. God made everything, and when you believe that, you know he has that kind of power, do you think you should fear him? You notice it says fear him? You know what it says in Proverbs about fear? It says in Proverbs chapter 14, in verse 25, the truthful witness saves lives, but he who utters lies is treacherous. In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence, and his children will have refuge. The fear of the Lord is the fountain of life, the one that one may avoid the snares of death. We have Jesus Christ who said this. He said, the thief, Satan, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But he said, I have come that you might have life. And I'm going to tell you something. The fear of God is not going, oh, I'm afraid of God because he's our loving. No, it's taking him seriously. It's looking at God and his word and realize that there is a judge, that he sees all, that he hears all, that he made all, that he's all powerful. He knows everything. He's always present. He's right there. And nothing you do in secret will ever be missed by God's eye and by his ear. And we will give an account to a judge, a holy God. I want to tell you right now, we need to get back to recognizing God as a creator if we want to have hope in our nation. And that's true for all nations. Then the third thing is that we need to remember that God is interested in our affairs. See, a lot of people think God doesn't really care. Well, that's not true. Psalm 8, 4 says, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Pastor Jeff had mentioned in his all-knowing, he has our hair on our head numbered. And it's a, it's a quickly changing thing with me, so he's got it, his hands full there. And he says, Acts 14, 7, Paul speaks of how the Lord sends rain, fruitful season, food, etc. Psalm 65, 9, God visits the earth with rain. It rains on the just and the unjust. And, and then in Psalm 33, starting in verse 10, let's read what it says there. It says, the Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. For his dwelling place he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all. He who understands all their works. That's our God. He knows it. He gets it. He sees it. And he cares. You see, I'm going to say it again. I said it earlier. You can love, but without truth, it's not love. And God has given us this as his truth. And we can either rebel at it. We can either excuse it. We can either say, well, they were unenlightened. You can rewrite what they meant. Or you can bow to the truth of all of the word of God and the counsel of God. It's sure, it's true, it's amen. 
It is. He's interested in our affairs, and he deals with us like a father in love, mercy, and grace. And in that, he always tells the truth because we are born into sin, depraved and selfish and messed up. And then if we just go, well, God made me that way. No, God didn't make you born into sin. You came after Adam and Eve who sinned. You were born a sinner. And you see it as little kids. They're selfish. They're full of themselves. And sin nature is a part of it. And just because you feel a certain way and you want something that's not right, just because you say, well, I can't help it. I, I'm born this way. What, temper? Oh, yeah, you got a bad temper. That's just who I am. I can't help baloney. Bible talks all about being angry. Don't do that. You can get over it. Get more of God. Get his truth. Get his spirit. Get born again. Get full of God. God is interested in our affairs, and he loves us enough to point it out straight. And he, third, the last thing, the fourth thing is he, we need to rely on God for our safety. You know, I think military is good. I think the person ought to do everything they can for good. They ought to be politically active. I don't think that's wrong. I think, I think we ought to uh, be involved in the school boards and the, our city you know, mayor and the councilman and, and be involved in things and, and, and be salt and be like, do things that matter. But ultimately, you do everything you can do, but you pray as if it's all up to God because ultimately, God is the one that has to do the work. And, and you know, we can rely on our military for safety, but we know today there's a lot of ways they can get to us that have nothing to do with military, right? I mean, are you ready to die? Have you ever thought of uh, germ warfare? Huh? Poisoning our water system? All kinds of things. And you know, the devil, he hates freedom. He wants, he wants, he wants to, to rule and reign. He's been looking for his antichrist forever. Anyone wants to rule the world, dominate people, be the elite one. And he's tried it through Hitler. He's tried it through Alexander the Great and, the, and many other dictators around the world that make their people subjects. But the, until God says, okay, the Antichrist isn't going to rise up. They have the spirit of the devil in them that gives them the desires of the devil. That's that he wants to be God and he wants to rule and he wants to use, do it through a man who's going to go to the temple halfway through the tribulation period and say, here, I, you know, worship me and demand people worship him. That's what he says to Israel. You better get out of there quick because this guy's about to mess with you. You better run to the hills. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, the spirit of Antichrist has been trying to get into man for a long time because Satan's been wanting to rule, but Satan never going to get that happen until God says it's okay now, right? So I'm telling you right now, evil exists in our world. We need God. We need his protection. We need his power. And I'm going to tell you, we need his safety because our military might is not going to do it. Look at it, it says in 33, 16, Psalm 33, 16, it says this. The king is not saved by a mighty army. A warrior is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a false hope for victory, nor does it deliver anyone by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope for his loving kindness, to deliver their soul from death. That's talking about eternal separation from God. It's talking about hell. And to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. Oh, I wish that that would be the truth again here. We look to God, but we can't rely on anything else but God for our safety and our provision. Remember Judges chapter 7, the Gideonites. Gideon himself, rather. He, he had 300 men that God whittled his army down to to defeat 135,000 Midianites. We say in the founding of our nation that God blessed and helped George Washington and others. Let me tell you something, another thing, because of freedom. Let me tell you something else. In World War II, there's no way we win that war without God intervening. If you read the history, it's miraculous that America and its allies, England and so forth, that we defeated Germany. You realize that? God stepped in and stopped it. We rely on him. Again, we did all we could do. We had brave men and women, nothing to take away from them. But in the end, God moved in and he miraculously made a way for freedom to stand. And freedom must stand and move on. For who the Son sets free is free indeed. He wants to free you from sin, from self, from greed, from lust. Free you so you can live for him, praising him freely without fear. Because fear is a bondage. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. We know. We stand on God. So let me just say it again. Say it one more time. 
We have to trust God for our protection. And then the last thing it says, oh, notice verse 20 and 21. I wish this was true in America. Our soul waits for the Lord. He's our help and our shield. For our heart rejoices in him because we trust in his holy name. Mm -mm -mm. I wish America did that. Rejoiced in God, waited for God, and realized he's the help, realized he's a shield, and trust in his holy name. You're supposed to be a holy people, right? Peter, you're called out of darkness into his glorious light. You are a chosen generation, a holy nation, a peculiar people. And I know that most of you look at me when you think that part of it, the peculiar people thing. But it's talking about being different so the world notices there's holiness, not just because you're a Texan that's got a couple of brain cells that are missing because the sun burn them up, you know. And that's not the peculiar he's talking about. He's talking about being different. People see it. So I hope that we can get back there because America needs a hope. A hope of a nation is this right here. We need God. And finally, to repent so we get mercy from the Lord because we need the mercy of the Lord. The psalmist said his mercies are due every morning, new every morning, so he's given us opportunity for mercy. The Psalm 33, 22, let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. Your steadfast love is just another way of saying it, that he continues to show kindness and forgiveness. Will you bow your head with me? Stan, will you? Might want to open your eyes, or some of you need to open your eyes when you stand. If you're watching online, or you're in the mass service, would you close your eyes, and everyone here too, and bow your head down to give privacy. And those of you at home, I want you to do that because what I want to happen is, I want you to truly engage right now and not disengage, it's not over. Because you can hear that truth, but if you don't reply to it, respond to it, what good is it in your own heart? This is your choice. And I want everyone that's in a public place, both at the mask on service and here, to have the privacy so that I'm gonna look around and if you, I'm gonna stop until you get your eyes closed and your heads down because I'm not letting you, I'm gonna make sure everyone feels safe. Because I'm gonna ask you something. America's got sins of pride, of greed, of lust, selfishness, unforgiveness, unkindness, not gentle, a lack of faith, a lack of devotion, putting other things before God, trusting in things that will not help you in the end, that aren't eternal. And if you're here, everybody close your eyes and bow your head to the ground. When your head is down, then I'll know you're not looking around. And you hear you say, there's something I need to repent of. And you'll lift your hand. At home, is there something you need to repent of? In the mask on, something God's Spirit is speaking to you about, you need to re repent. And one of the big ones in the church is dissension, strife, and unforgiveness. Do you lift your hand right now, all over this place? Anything you need to make right, come on. Come on. Be honest, put it right there, hold it up. I would say that if you really examine the, by the Spirit, when the psalmist said, search me, O God, see my heart, know my thoughts, see if there be any wicked way in me. Is there something that needs to change? Father, forgive us for panic and fear. Forgive us for lust and greed and pride and selfishness. Forgive us for putting our hope in things that will fail us. Forgive us for living for, for the things money can buy. We're living for pleasures of this world. Lord, may our joy and delight be in you, Jesus. A double joy here and in heaven. May our eyes be fixed on Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. This is the, a nation's hope. It's you, Jesus, and we have you. They need us to be holy so we have the power of your word, of your spirit living in us. So there's anointing and equipping to break through the hard ground. We need a fullness, like the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. The Spirit of God came upon them, and Peter became, instead of hiding from a little girl, he became anointed and spoke with authority. We need your guidance of the Spirit, God. We need your help. Help us, Jesus, be the church. We're not gonna back up. We're not gonna put it on pause. 
We're going to stay right with you, God, live for you. We're moving forward. We're putting the pedal to the metal because the world is afraid, and we got the answer. There's no fear in the name of Jesus. There's no fear in his perfect love. There's no fear. We have you, God. I pray, Lord, forgive sin right now as they call on you. Cleanse it. Move it for them, God. Don't let them live in guilt or condemnation. I know that we can't, by the bootstraps, make ourselves good enough. But your grace is power to come in and change our hearts. The same Spirit, we're born again by the Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, raises us from dead in our trespasses and sin so that we no longer are captive and held bondage. And I pray that any chains be broken and people set free of anything is a bondage that holds them captive, that they're having a hard time getting over. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke the enemy and that, that stronghold. We break that stronghold and tear it down in the name of Jesus in the realm of the Spirit, God. In the heavens, move mightily, we pray, Father, in Jesus' name. And I pray for churches in our city and our nation. They quit kowtowing, tell the truth to get people right with you, God. Church attenders are never going to change the world. It's just going to tell the world they don't need it because there's no power in it. We're no different. We're salt, we're light, God. Holy Spirit, move across this place right now in the name of Jesus that upon people in their homes, God, and in the mass service, and be powerful, God, to change our lives and our hearts, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. A little embracing of Christianity as an ideology or my choice of religions doesn't change us. We need you, Jesus, in our hearts. If you're here and you need Jesus in your heart to change your heart, just ask him right now, Jesus, change my heart. By your spirit, make me new. Give me desire to live for you. Set me free from captivity. Give me a hunger for your word. Let me put you before my family, before my money, before my lust, and before my pride, before my selfish desires. May I honor you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. And I have a word I believe, and that is that some of you are never going to be okay with life, and you're not going to make heaven, even though you believe the right thing. And Jesus said... He's going to look at some people and he's going to say this, depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of the evil. Even though they said, look at the wonderful works we did. And here's why, because you don't have forgiveness in your heart. You're angry, you're bitter, you're hateful. There's somebody you're not forgiving. You've got to forgive. It's up to God. Jesus said, let the judge be the judge. Let God deal with that. You just forgive it and move on. Be gracious. You know, I think Georgie, I don't know if she's here or not, but the thing I love about your husband, the most forgiving, gracious, merciful man that ever walked the face of the earth. That's godliness. God bless you guys. You're a great church.